In the Old Testament, we find that there was a place that God had prescribed <clears throat> uh, for the people to come, make sacrifices and what have you, and that was called the tabernacle. And so they built it in the wilderness. Tabernacle is a big fancy word for a big fancy tent. Uh, then eventually, that building would be replaced with a permanent uh, facility called the temple. So that was the place. But now you have the place, you need somebody to help the people that show up actually do the sacrifices and those kind of things. And so God instituted the priesthood. And this came through the tribe of Levi. And then one particular family of Levites uh, that descended from Aaron would be the high priest. So what's the point of the tabernacle and the temple and all the Levites and, and Aaron is the high priest and all that? The purpose was for people to be made right with God. And that was the intention. That was the goal. So that People who are sinful might be made right with God. But there was a problem. It didn't work as well as it could have. And so eventually God was going to send someone else not from the tribe of Levi. And so we're going to read about that in Hebrews chapter 7. So we turn to Hebrews chapter 7. And we're going to start looking at verse 11. <clears throat> So Hebrews chapter 7 and starting in verse 11, the Bible says, Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there's necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, <clears throat> it starts off with a description of this kind of priestly heritage. And we've got a couple of them that are laid out here. Now, what does it mean if perfection? That means to be made completely right with God, to have all of your sins taken away, um, to be, you know, it, it's, it's the God standard, so to speak. And if that had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, now watch this, for under it, the people received the law. Does that mean that it is possible to keep all 613 by some counts? That number varies a little bit. We'll go with 613. Is it possible to keep all 613 laws? I believe the answer is no. As a matter of fact, I believe that God gave his law to point out that we can never reach his standard. God's law is God's standard, and you and I are not going to achieve on our own God's standard. <clears throat> and so, uh, perfection was not attainable through that. So, if it had been, well, why would we need someone after the order of Melchizedek? Now, this is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 4, where the Bible says that there's coming someone who will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, and so, as a matter of fact, Psalm 110, verse 4 is kind of the basis of what, all that we find in here. And so, that's what the reference is. So, why would we have someone following Melchizedek rather than someone after the order of Aaron? And why would we do that? Because when there's a change, if we go from the Levitical priesthood to the Melchizedek priesthood, then there's going to be a change in the law as well. Now, what kind of change is there? Well, according to the law, and if you can read all about this in Leviticus chapters 28 and 29, the institution of the priesthood and Aaron is the high priest and all that. Uh, as long as they're serving, there's no need to change. But now we've got to change the law so that someone after the order of Melchizedek. And so what he says is, look, according to the Old Testament, only Levites could offer sacrifices. Only Levites could serve as priests. If that's the case... Jesus cannot be your priest and Jesus cannot make you right with God because Jesus is not from the line of Levi. Jesus is from the line of Judah. 
That's what he says in verses 12, 13, and 14. He said, look, Moses uh, said this is, you know, when God gave him the commands, it comes through Levi. And so he says, but now we have a different priesthood. And so that's important so that someone from the tribe of Judah can offer a sacrifice and can serve as a priest to make us right with God. And so he says, kind of got the, uh, the, the two lines. So we have the Levitical line and that works and, and, and but, but not as well as, 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 well, not good enough. And so now we have another one that's going to come and we're going to transition from Levite's priesthood to Melchizedek's priesthood. Now, this is not a violent overthrow of the Old Testament. It's not a refutation of the Levites. It is a transition from Levi to Melchizedek. Now, I like the United States of America. And I realize that in many parts of our country today, that would put me, unfortunately, in a minority. But I still believe it's the greatest country on the earth. We do have more freedoms than most places. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a patriot in more ways than one, if you know my football team. Uh, but... Look, most of the world thinks the United States is great. That's why we've got more people trying to get in than trying to get out. But one of the interesting things about American history, and U.S. history is full of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm aware of that. But one of the interesting things is that we have had 38 presidential transitions in our 224-year history. And when you think about it, none of those have been by some kind of violence or split the country in half. They've been relatively peaceful. There was one that was pretty bumpy, which would be expected, and that was Abraham Lincoln because the country was already dividing and some states didn't want to recognize him because they were, were already uh, in movement to secede. And so it was a really a, a not the best of times in our country's history. But when you think about it, 38 transitions, and not all of those have been within the same party. But they've been relatively peaceful. What we're talking about here is a peaceful transition from Levi to Melchizedek. Jesus didn't come to blow something up. Jesus didn't come to destroy. He said he came to fulfill. And so this is a, a peaceful move from the Levite line now over to the one who's after the order of Melchizedek. Now why is it so important that Jesus be a priest after Melchizedek rather than after uh, the Levites? Well, because of verse 15. I said this becomes even more evident. When another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek from his line, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Now, this is, this is important. The Levites, they want to say, well, why do you serve as a priest? It's the family business. I was born into it. Here's my genealogy. I'm tribe of Levi and this is what we do. We serve as priests. And so it was hereditary. And that's why he said that, that the, the priesthood that Jesus has is not going to be based on this bodily, this legal bodily descent from the tribe of Levi. But instead, his right as a priest is seen in the fact that he has an indestructible life. Now think about it. Priest lives and dies. Priest lives and dies. Priest lives and they just generation after generation, they live, serve, and die but not Jesus. There's only one, one high priest in Jesus' line, and that's him, because he is eternal. And so there's no need to replace him with future descendants. And so he has an, an indestructible life. Now watch how cool this is. Because Jesus has an indestructible life, everyone who is in him is also indestructible. We have everlasting life because we are in the one who is everlasting life, who is eternal life. And so that's why he says, verse 17, it is witnessed of him. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I want to make sure we understand. I want to, because I think this is one of the key points of really the whole Bible, but certainly this passage. This is not Old Testament bad, New Testament good, Levi bad, Jesus good. It's not like that. Aaron and the other Levites serving was a good thing. But he could only take them so far. He could only do so much. We needed something that was better. So, think about this. For a long time, this is how you took notes. Now, I know most people used yellow pad. I never liked the yellow. I found it difficult. My eyes didn't do as well. I like the contrast. Um, and so, this was a pad. 
Some of you look because you've never seen one of these. So I just want you to know that your mom, your dad, and your grandparents, this is what they used to take notes. They would sit in class and they would take notes. And then they would draw lines and go put this back up there. And they'd star stuff. And, and then they'd learn to look over at somebody that had the professor before. And they go, that means this is on the test. Um, or as my students tell one another, if he says it would behoove you to know this, it's on the test. Uh, and so this is how you did it. Now, you did it with one of these. This is called a pen. You click it and you would write, you would write the notes with one of these. And almost everybody used to carry one of these. Now, if you ask somebody, do you have a pen I can borrow? They'll get you like, do you need to put your clothes back together or you need to stick? I'm like, we think of like a straight pen, but this is how you took notes. There was nothing wrong with this. this, this there's nothing wrong with this. This got me through school. This is how we did it, All right? But something better came along. Now, here's what's crazy. Not only can I take notes on this, I don't even have to, I'm not going to type them. I'm going to use my fingers. I took the record button and I can speak. Now I realize it gets half the words wrong. <laughs> and that's probably because it was developed by somebody that doesn't speak correctly, but has a non-Southern accent. <laughs> so when I, it gets, you know, it, it never gets the word y'all right. But anyway, but I can, I can, I can take notes. As a matter of fact, if we're in a conversation and I want to remember the conversation, I don't have to take notes. All I have to do in the state of Arizona is tell you I'm recording. I don't have to have your permission. I just have to inform you. And so I can just say, I'm recording this conversation. Now, maybe I should just record this right now. <laughs> Go back and watch in slow motion and see who's already asleep. <laughs> and so, you, it's, listen, it's not one versus the other. It is one that was good and now something better. Because if you take notes on this and you lose them, they're gone. Throw them away, they're gone. You take notes on this, man, if you got that bad boy backed up on the cloud, they are eternal. Even if you delete them, you can go and find them and put them back. As a matter of fact, if you have something on your computer and you think you've wiped it, just give me your hard drive. I can find it. Unless you've completely super magnetized and poured acid on your hard drive, I can't get it. And in some cases, I could still get it. Like, man, you talk about permanent. That, it's permanent. So here's what we're going to start doing. When you get a new computer, you give me your old hard drive and the pastor will see what you've been looking at on the internet. (laughs) Don't be scared of me knowing. Be scared of God knowing. And so he said that Jesus didn't come like to say, oh, that was bad. He said, this is better. This is eternal. It is everlasting him as our high priest. And so in verse 18, he wants to drive home the point about how permanent this is. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness for the law was made, uh, for the law made nothing perfect. Now I want to talk about this for a minute. It's very, very, very important to me and very, very personal to me. In addition to being the pastor here at First Baptist Chandler, I'm also a halftime professor at a graduate school for pastors. Gateway Seminary, so we do master's and PhD stuff. And um, that's not only my professor there, but my area of expertise is the Old Testament. I'm an Old Testament professor. So some people read these verses and think, we can just throw out the Old Testament, keep just the New Testament. I find that personally offensive because this is what I spent my life studying and teaching. But also, it's just simply not true. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus only quoted from the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul told Timothy to preach the word, and the only word they had was the Old Testament. He's not saying throw out the Old Testament. What he's saying is that the Old Testament wasn't finished. It's not ineffective. It's just not complete. The Old Testament, in fact, I think one of the reasons why a lot of people don't understand the New Testament is because they don't know the Old Testament. They understand, why is it so important that Jesus be king? If you understand the Old Testament and what a king did and the fact that all justice resided in the person of the king, not in the document, you understand why it's important that we have Jesus as king because there's no imperfection or injustice in him. Therefore, in Jesus, perfect justice is carried out. That's why the New Testament talks so much about Jesus being the king because he ain't Caesar and that's a good thing. And so he's not saying we need to throw away the Old Testament. That's known as the Martian heresy, if you want to know. We need the whole Bible. But there's a reason why we have a New Testament. The Old Testament, God's work wasn't finished yet. 
His word wasn't completed. And so it's like episode one. Or four, if you're a Star Wars fan and they're all whacked up out of order. But using normal order, it's like episode one. Episode two doesn't throw away episode one. Episode two completes it. Well, that's a Star Wars when we have 87 episodes, but that's a whole nother story. And so the New Testament's like, it's the completion. And so up until then, we had something that was good, but the problem is it was not good enough to eternally get rid of sin. It was not good enough to, to declare us perfect before God. And so we have a, a new line now that's come, a new chapter that has been added. So on the other hand, we have a, a better hope that has been introduced to which we draw near to God. So we have a new way, not through the line of Aaron and Levi, but a new way. And that is through Jesus, who is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's why in verse 20, so you know, the Old Testament priests, they didn't, they didn't have an oath sworn to them. Verse 20. But Jesus does. Psalm 110 verse 4 again. He's made a priest by an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever. So watch what he says in verse 22. Not that Jesus is the guarantor of a completely different covenant. And we throw the old one away because it was bad. The old one was good. But Jesus comes as one that is better because it's one that is eternal. It will do what the old covenant could not do. It can complete it out. So let me just kind of show you how this works. You know, a wagon is a good thing. Load your family up. You can travel in a wagon. You may not travel fast, but you can travel. The expansion through the West, part of the United States, was driven by the, the prairie schooners, by wagons. Wagons work great until you show up at the ocean. The wagon can only take you so far. But now we need something new, something better. The Old Testament priesthood could only take them so far. They needed something better, and that better is Jesus Christ. He came to make not a temporary sacrifice, but a permanent sacrifice, a complete sacrifice. Now, I recognize that people have lots and lots and lots and lots of questions about who in the world is Jesus. What do you do? Why does it matter? I mean, we have, people have lots and lots. Matter of fact, they're kind of like this kid. Where do you live? In the city. Do you have a house? Apartment. What a rent? Rent. What do you do for a living? Lots of things. Where's your office? I don't have one. How come? I don't need one. Where's your wife? Don't have one. How come? It's a long story. Do you have kids? No, I don't. How come? It's an even longer story. Are you my dad's brother? What's your record for consecutive questions asked? 38. I'm your dad's brother, all right. <laughs> I think some of us have lots and lots, I get it, we have lots of questions about Jesus and I'm not going to attempt to answer all of them this morning because we would like to finish this morning. But there is one question, I guess, really, really, who is he? Who is Jesus? What is significant about him? When people ask the question, why is Jesus so important? I realize there are lots of other questions. What does it mean to be born of a virgin? Why did Jesus disappear for 30 years except for one episode when he was 12 years old? Why did he call the kinds of people he did? I mean, there's lots and lots and lots of questions. But there's one that stands with Who is he and why is he so important? Those are simple questions to which, believe it or not, there really is a simple answer. Jesus is God's son who died on the cross and rose again so that through him, you and I might be made right with God permanently. There have been lots of goats and sheep and pigeons and other things that had died along the way, but they weren't good enough to make us right with God permanently. But Jesus showed up and Jesus gave himself, his own life, as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for all of my guilt so that I can be made right with God permanently. And this permanently is very, very, very important that we are permanently right with God through Jesus Christ. Can you imagine how horrifying it would be if we showed up here on a Sunday morning and we went through some religious rituals and then at the end I said, okay, now what we've done will make you right with God for a few days, but don't mess up. Some of you wouldn't make it through the afternoon. <laughs> what would you do if I said, all right, now, we did that. Now, if you'll come and work in Awana, that'll get you through into next week. And then if you give faithfully, that'll get you two weeks. And if you join a prayer group, that'll get you two and a half. If you're a part of the women's ministry, being a female, <laughs> men's ministry, being a male, we don't have any other options. If you do all that, that'll get you... Maybe three weeks. I don't know about you. I wouldn't find that encouraging at all. 
I would find that. Can you imagine if what you heard every Sunday was, listen, you better stay with it because you miss a couple of weeks and you are in eternal trouble. <laughs> what we have to offer you is hope for less than a month. Now, for some of you super saints, we'll give you a whole month. But for most of you, it's not going to, it's not going to go well for you. I, don't know, that, I wouldn't find that encouraging. I wouldn't find that good news, but that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that in Jesus Christ, if you belong to him, you are his eternally, permanently, and no one can take that from you. So here's what I want you to understand. Don't live under your own guilt. Live in the freedom of knowing that you belong to Jesus forever. That you're his permanently because he gave a permanent sacrifice once for all for sin and it won't ever have to be done again and he won't die and be replaced by another because he is eternal. Now that's good news. So here's what that means. And some of you need to listen to me real carefully. Quit worrying all the time. I know the world screwed up. It's been that way since they ate from the wrong tree. Relax. God's not worried. Some of you are going to worry yourself to an early death. You're going to stand before God. He's going to look at you and go, why are you so worried? You don't think I can handle it? I got this. Years ago, I came to the conclusion that what we need is a relaxed Christianity. Quit trying to impress God. Just enjoy that you're here, his forever in Jesus. Because listen, Jesus doesn't come up and go, hey, look, you're mine. It was a tremendous price. I died on the cross for you. So we're going to work out a repayment plan. <laughs> Jesus doesn't do that. We're his forever. He has an indestructible life. Therefore, we have an indestructible salvation. We don't walk around in arrogance. We walk around in confidence that we belong to him forever. So quit worrying all the time. Just relax and enjoy belonging to Jesus. Just, just look. <laughs> Don't think that God is out to get you if he already got you. Just enjoy the fact you belong to him forever. That's why I think the most important statement in here is that he has an indestructible life. I don't want a savior that could be one-upped by somebody. I don't want a savior that might falter at the end. How many of you have a, like a favorite sports team or something you watch or follow? All right, now lines of sin, come on. I know so you got some sport that you like, something you follow. How many of you have ever seen your team get to the final game or the final series and they lost? I know what it feels like. I know the pain, the anguish, the disappointment. I can remember when my undefeated Patriots lost the Super Bowl. I didn't turn my cell phone on for two days. <laughs> they want any of you who's texting me or calling me. I just want to be cut off from the world. I know what it's like. Listen to me. Jesus is never going to show up at the final game and lose. He is always victorious because in indestructible life. So just live in confidence in him and quit fretting and worrying. Just relax. Relax. He's got you. He's got this. We don't have a priest who's going to die like all those Levites. We have a high priest who makes us right with God, who is eternal and will make us right with God for all of eternity in him. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is. We thank you for the Old Testament, understanding the significance of what Jesus did and how all of that worked through Aaron the high priest and the Levites and, and, and all that complicated stuff. We recognize so much of what Jesus did in making all that permanent. And Father, we thank you that Jesus is not a temporary high priest. He's not one that can make us right with you for a while, but then it kind of fades away. It doesn't last. But he has an indestructible life. Therefore, he has an indestructible priesthood. Therefore, he has an indestructible salvation that he gives to us. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to relax, knowing that we belong to you forever. And knowing that you are king forever. And knowing that nothing can take us away or separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Father, I pray that you would remind us of how great it is that Jesus is the guarantor of a better covenant. An everlasting covenant. An eternal covenant. That we are right with you forever in him. And that we don't have to pay it back. 
You don't have to work it off. We can just celebrate and rejoice in it. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.